All right, Miss Erin. All right. Thanks for coming on uh, the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for the invite. Fun to be doing this with you. Yeah, my pleasure. So um, I was just looking at your bio, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Getting uh, all prepped. Well, not, you know, hey, I don't typically do this, but I was reading your bio because, you know, you and I are prepping a, a course together for the end of April. And I was looking at the bio that I had, and of course I was reading yours too. And I and I was kind of intrigued. So you you've worked with organization organizations in all over the world. I have, and you know what's funny is um, I never really think about that until I have to do something like write a bio, yeah. or I'm writing a proposal for a company, and, and you know it's all about the like, well, what's interesting, what's going to intrigue you know, the potential client and what do I want to share? And I go, oh, right. It did work with this company or this individual that lived in the Middle East. Oh, right. I did work with this group that was based in Singapore. So, you know, I kind of forget about that. And then I go, oh, right. I, I've done some of this stuff. Um, yeah. So it's funny that you bring that up. Yeah. Well, I was looking at it I'm like, well, that's pretty bloody impressive. I mean, I, I've worked with people around North America. Um, but I mean, this is, this is cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. And you've been coaching for quite a while. Hey, like, looks like since 2009. Yes. So that's when I started my coach training, which is kind of an um, interesting story, how I even got into coaching. Um, but that was back in 2009. And so it's amazing how much time has gone by um, you know, calling myself a coach. So I've been a coach longer than I've done anything else now. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> and so you started out with a bachelor in kinesiology. What was your plan when you did that? I, well, I had lots of big dreams, you know, going into kinesiology. I thought, um, you know, this is going to be a pathway for me to get into sport med. That was something I was really interested in. Right. Um, I also thought, you know, I really enjoyed just anything to do with the human body and sport and physiology. And so I thought, you know, that was a great stepping stone to do that. And when I got into kines, I mean, I, I loved the curriculum. I thought it was fascinating. Um, but what I realized while I was in my undergrad was, I couldn't imagine spending another 10 plus years in school. <laughs> and the other thing that I, I recognized when I was in Kines, I had some great opportunities to connect with and shadow um, some of the best in, in high performance sports. So some of the best physiologists, some of the best um, physiotherapists, massage therapists, all these people who are some of the best in their field. And I found them fascinating and I thought, I can't do this every single day of my life. Right. It just, it was clear to me that that wasn't actually the life that I wanted to live. Even though I found the content fascinating, I found the people fascinating. Um, there was something that was missing in it for me. Right. Um, and it wasn't until I finished my undergrad and I'd had the opportunity to actually work while I was going to school. So I was working in the field, not as a kinesiologist, but as a, a sport administrator. Um, that again, I was like, I love this, this world of sport and high performance and planning and strategy. And I thought it was all fascinating. But what was missing for me was the human side of it. Right. Like when you're talking, even as you're talking, I'm like, yeah, you know, I, I can see you finding physiology really fascinating, but I think what, like just knowing you and having worked with you a little bit, I know you're fascinated with people, like people yeah. and behavior and behavior change. And I think that's when you're talking about, you know, wanting to work in high performance sports, I would think that like that kind of motivation, that kind of drive, that kind of goal setting mm -hmm. and strategies, mm -hmm. like you say, strategy and development is what really you're about. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, there was like, there was a piece there that was such a fit for me. Yeah. And, and what I noticed, um, again, sort of living in that world, it was my, it was like 24 hours a day. Everybody that was in that environment, like slept, ate, talked about athletes and performance and sport and, you know, the, this culture of sport. Um, so it was like my entire life. And again, it was, there was so much that I loved about it. But what I started to see was that 
not just athletes, but coaches, administrators, they didn't have balance in their life. No. <laughs> so it was like this, this extreme. And so I saw, especially athletes that, and coaches too, that were moving from a life of sport and maybe retiring or transitioning into something else, yeah. they struggled so much. Yeah. And the message that was reinforced in this environment was, we're here to support the athlete and the performance of the athlete and the performance of the team. It's almost as if a life outside of that doesn't exist. Right. So these athletes would, and again, everybody that was in the system. So the trainers, everybody would leave the field of play and go home to relationships that were broken. Right. Because they didn't have the tools and they didn't have the support to, to be a complete person. And it's not to say that that was totally ignored, but the messaging was that this is where excellence lives. And we're kind of going to just pretend that there isn't something else outside of this. Yeah. And what I found over the years, so I graduated, um, I had this, I was offered this great role um, with an organization and I was there for a couple of years. And I, um, I found that I had this revolving door of people. Again, this could be a head coach of a team. This could be their physiologist. This could be um, another administrator. They kept coming to me for someone to talk to. Right. And we had great sports psychologists. We had great support systems. But again, their focus was performance. And for whatever reason, they, these people found that they could come and talk to me and share what was going on. And they wanted to talk about the fact that maybe their marriage was falling apart. Yeah. And I recognized in that time that I needed another skill set to support people with that. Um, I loved that I was the one that they came to. Like, obviously, I created something that felt safe for them, um, that was non judgmental. But I recognized if this is what I'm good at, I need another skill set. Cool. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I'm listening to you talk about how zeroed in they were on performance and excellence in their sport. And I'm thinking, you know, up to to the neglect of other things, right? Relationships mm -hmm. and balance and, and, and life outside of the sport. And I'm thinking, don't you think that that's kind of, don't you think you kind of have to be that way though, to do that kind I, of level of sports performance? I agree. Yeah. Like it, it is like, it is kind of like putting the blinders on. Yeah. Um, because they have to. Yeah. And, and so it's not to say that it's wrong. No, no. I didn't hear you say it was wrong. No, but no. that, there was an imbalance there. And, um, and again, it's, it doesn't mean that something needs to change in the system, but what I recognized I was drawn towards was how can I support the whole person, right? right? Is there actually an ability to be successful at life in all facets of life at the same time? Right. And so right. I got really curious about that. It's interesting you say too, I heard you say, I don't, I can't imagine being in school for 10 more years. I mean, your coach certification training was no drop in the bucket. Like this was intense, no. long-term <laughs> training, right? So tell me yeah. about that kind of training that you did. Sure. So um, the program that I went through is called the Coaches Training Institute. Um, they've now shifted their name to their called Coactive Leadership Institute, because really it does come down to we're building better leaders in the world. So you may not consider yourself a leader. Yeah. Um, you may not use that term, but it really is about people stepping up and being more of a leader in their life. Um, and so I went through that training back in, that was 2009. I started that training. Um, you know, I would say it's one of the most rigorous programs in terms of coach training that's out there. And I feel very proud of that. There's yeah. lots of, um, you know, weekend courses or hour long courses that are out there. Not to say that they're not offering great tools for people. Um, but you know, what was a fit for me was if I'm going to do this and I'm going to hang my shingle as a coach, I want to do this right. Mm -hmm. I want to know that I've received the best training that's out there. Um, so I'm very proud of that. And so there was, um, they have a core curriculum that it's, you know, depending on your schedule can take, you know, it's maybe six months to a year, depending on again, scheduling. Um, and then you can go through a certification program if you want to, that is recognized by the international coach federation. 
So they're the governing body, one of the leading governing bodies um, for coaches in the world. And so I completed my certification with them. Um, I have my professional coaching certification through the ICF. Um, And then what I've done over the years is taken other courses, taken other coach training programs, which is, you know, may seem odd to do another certification or complete another program. But what was important to me was, um, I mean, I was aware that there's so many models out there and I wanted to have a grasp on, um, you know, other ways of using this tool um, that's going to better serve my clients. So I've continued to take other programs um, and, you know, there's, there's differences in language, but at the end of the day, there's, they're more similar than they are different in my mind. So, um, yeah, I'll continue to do that as well. Well, good for you. I mean, and I think as I I just have such uh, regard, I think for your commitment to continuing education, like you are always learning, you are a lifelong learner and you have a coach. I mean, you are committed not only yes. to other people's development, but your own as well, concurrently. Mm-hmm. Like, I think it's, it's just, it's very professional. <laughs> like, you take it very seriously. You don't just, you didn't just go do a, a training course and now you're just sort of out there winging it. You are, you know, you're very grounded in content and best practice and um, it shows. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I think, um, if I want others to see this as a, a legitimate profession yes. that needs to be recognized in more areas of our, our businesses and in our life, then I have to walk the talk. I have to treat it as a professional designation as well. So that means, you know, I think of it no differently than if I was a nurse, if I was a lawyer, if yeah. I was a teacher, if, you know, on and on these professional designations that you know, the professional development that's required, the licensing, the regulations, the code of ethics, in all of those areas, or all of those, you know, different industries, I need to treat my own the same way, even if nobody else does, or even if the majority of people who call themselves coaches out there don't do the same, I'm going to do that. Yeah, they don't yet. Like I, I, I still help hold out hope that, you know, coaching is, you know, there's a professional body out there for sure. Mm-hmm. Like you say, the ICF, but, but there's no regulation yet. So anybody can call themselves a coach, right? And yeah. so, and so we do see that, you know, I mean, I say that I am a, I, I call myself a consultant Mm -hmm. Um, Because I know that what I do is, is not coaching. Like there, there is a component of, of a coaching tone to what I do, but I, um, there's a lot of mentoring in what I do Mm -hmm. as well. Like I do use my own experience as examples of what to do and what not to do. And that's not coaching. That's more mentoring than coaching in my mind. Well, I think that there's an, um, an ability to bring coaching tools and coaching skills yeah. into everything that you do. And, and because they're powerful and, um, and I think you are clear on the difference between calling yourself a coach versus calling yourself a consultant or a mentor. And I think, you know, once we understand that there is actually this continuum, yeah. um, you know, from counseling all the way to con- consulting and, yes. you know, where we are on that spectrum, there's value in all of those. And it's just recognizing um, one, what's your scope of work and what's your training and ability to use those skills and, you know, where is it appropriate and, and just knowing your client well enough to see what do they actually need in this moment. Right. Yeah. yeah. I do a lot of uh, referrals as well. So when I, when I do come across, I'm, I'm well aware of my boundaries and my, um, professional scope. And so that when I do come and I, and I don't know that I would know that or understand that or respect that had I not been a nurse for 25 mm-hmm. years, you know, scope of practice, ethics, professional development, regulatory bodies, all of that. I have such regard for that, you know, and, um, reflective practice, you know, mm-hmm. all of that stuff. And I, I'm really grateful to, to my nursing career for having planted that in me. And, yeah. and I think it, 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 you know, so yeah, so today when I do come across something that's outside of my scope, 
uh, which I do regularly, you know, come across people who are struggling with multiple things. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do not counsel. I am not a psychologist. And so when I, when I feel like, you know, a client is, is brushing up against sort of the need for those things, Mm -hmm. I, I very quickly say, okay, so here's what I would recommend for you because I am really good at shopping yeah, you for are. consuming and and referring people to to really great resources i'm a, i'm an excellent um consumer of healthcare um <laughs> and and other kinds of uh care because uh, yeah we've made so many mistakes honestly in the way that we've approached things and i've learned so much from that as well as i think just being having an inside track on you know there's different kinds of like you say, like there's different kinds of coaches out there. How do you shop for Absolutely. a coach? Yeah. How do you, what kind of question. questions do you ask? Yeah. So what kind of questions do you recommend people ask when they're shopping for a coach, Erin? Mm-hmm. I, well, I think the first thing they need to do is trust their, their intuitive feeling about somebody. So mm-hmm. I would say, number one, go and research this person, get a feel for them in terms of like what they have out there on their website, the language that they use. Um, it doesn't mean that every great coach has a great website, but I think it's more about what is the feeling, my initial feeling when I see a picture of this person, when I see something that they've written, when I, um, you know, maybe it's a referral that you've received from somebody else. So maybe a friend or a colleague has worked with this person. Just like get the sense of like, how do I feel when they describe this person to me? Because often, um, your intuition at the very beginning will give you great insight if this person is a fit or not. The other thing I say to people, even if they've called me and they said, I've already researched you, I know you're the person that I want to work with. Um, And we'll have an initial conversation about, because I need to know who are they now? How do they see the world right now? And can I actually support them in where they're trying to go? Because if I don't feel like it's a fit either, I will refer them on to somebody else. Yes. The other thing I say, even if we feel like, oh, this feels like magic right now. There's something really cool happening here. I feel really connected to this person. I want to support them. Um, I still recommend that they talk to somebody else. So it's so fascinating because even um, after that initial conversation, and we've got a sense of you know who the other person is and what they're trying to accomplish here. Um, and I say, okay, I've got two other coaches I'd like for you to connect with. And they go, no, 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 no. I actually feel really confident in this and I want to start working with you. And I say, that's great. You feel like somebody I really want to work with as well. I want you to be a hundred percent sure. And sometimes you don't know you're sure to that extent until you've met with somebody else. Because again, it's all about this like fit. Um, Someone else's flavor of coaching or style of coaching, you may not know I mean, most people don't know what's even out there. It's true. So I say you need to interview and you need to shop for around a little bit. Um, you know, I think that's really important. And, and I think it's the same. Um, I say the same thing to people who are clearly what they're needing is counseling Mm -hmm. is you have the right to shop for the right counselor. You have that. It's actually a responsibility to yourself. Nice. I like that. I like that. That's a responsibility. Yeah. So many people are worried about, I I mean, there's a vulnerability when you're in need of counseling, especially, and Mm -hmm. and, and coaching would be similar. I would think you're you're in a vulnerable place, right? You you need something, you have something that you need assistance with. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I, what I see is people will reach out, um, to someone and then even after an initial consult feel like there's a loyalty there that they need to stick with (laughs) that person. Right. uh, And, or they're going to take it. That person's going to be hurt or or insulted if they don't stay or if they say this isn't working. And, and I'm glad to hear you say that you really do push people to, to reach out to someone else. Yeah. Um, And it's not personal. Absolutely not. It's not and personal if it doesn't work. No. And I, um, I really want people to understand that the sign of a good coach is somebody who's not looking for the sale. Yeah. The sign of a good coach is someone who is so deeply committed to your development and your growth that 
it doesn't, they understand that it doesn't have to be with them. Yes. So I want people to feel like I want the best for you. And what I actually see as being the best for you is that you work with somebody else with a different style. Yeah. So I would be willing to miss out on that opportunity or the quote unquote sale, because that's actually what I want for people. And that's true. Man, that is, that is true. Just knowing you, like you're, that is not lip service. Like you mean that. Yeah, absolutely. You really do from a, from a very heart centered place, yeah. want what's best for people. <sighs> and I think people get that from you. That's I was just like, huh. <laughs> Shake it off, Marie. Like, but I think that's why people come to you. I think, you know, yeah. like you, you describe, you know, even in your sports performance world, people would be drawn to you and come to you, even though they had other coaches that, that were available to them, um, sports performance coaches, and they would still want to talk to you. You have that uh, draw. Like people, I think people know when they meet you that you are seeing them. Mm-hmm. And that is like, oh, yeah, it also scares wanna... a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, for <laughs> I sure. Would say just as much as it draws people in, it scares people because they're like, oh, no, she just saw right through me. Right. Like, I'm not ready for that. So right. just as much as like it does attract, it does have people sort of go, oh, that was a little bit too much for me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, the other thing I want to just um, touch on with this conversation is, um, cause it, it, it's all sounding so sort of very altruistic the way that I'm coming across in this, but there is another side to it. The other side for me, just to be fully transparent is I know that if I am not the right fit for somebody that I will resent them yeah. as my client within, you know, four to six weeks of this process, because if it's not a fit for me, it actually feels like something that is being taken from me versus this beautiful flow that happens. It's like giving and receiving that happens between a, a, an amazing coach client fit. Yeah. So if it's not there, it actually feels taxing for me. I'm not looking when I see, you know, who's on my roster for that day, instead of me feeling like, all right, here we go. Like we're, I can't wait for the work that we're about to do together. I'm going, okay. I just need to like put my feet down and ground for this next hour. That is not how I want to run my practice. I agree with you. And I did hear that, like, I, I, that did flash through my head. You know, you want to make sure it's a good fit too. I mean, yeah. and you, you say like, is it taking energy or giving you energy when you're working with them? Right. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a pretty good measure. Mm-hmm. And you get resentful when it's taking energy and you're not feeling like yeah. you're having an impact or, or that you're not being effective. Right. Uh, with that right. client. But I also think too, like being an entrepreneur is not easy. It is a oh. hassle. <laughs> right. So if, I mean, one of the very few benefits of being an entrepreneur, like the, the big benefits are you get to schedule your time and you get to choose mm-hmm. who you work with. And yeah. if you're not taking advantage of those two things, what, why are you doing this? Like if you're yeah. going to work with any Joe that comes along, go get a job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's hassle free. You take it as it comes you work with people you don't like, you work hours you don't like, but Mm -hmm. man, there's, there's stability, there's guaranteed income. You don't have to worry about the business, whether it's going to keep going or not. And you just Mm -hmm. put in your time and you come home with a check. So like I say, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, take advantage of the advantages and and you are like, I mean, that's a very selfish way to to describe it, but, (laughs) but I think that what it's what you're describing, like, you know, and I do the same thing. Like if I look at, if I know I got a client call coming up and I'm like, Oh, like that heavy Mm -hmm. feeling. I know this is not a good fit. This is not working. Like it's something, there's something about that client. It's usually that I don't feel equipped to help them or they're not willing to do the work, right? And right. It's resistant. not progressing. Yeah, they're yeah. not progressing. And I get frustrated. It's like, oh, yeah. Why am I doing this? This is a lot of yeah. work. Yeah. And I think it's just um versus thinking about it like this is right or it's wrong or they're this is a good client or a bad client. Like no. it really is about fit. And it's I think fit. it's like, what is this indicating? The fact that I am I'm feeling this way. I'm picking up on something that's happening on the other side right now. Um, and sometimes I've even felt it with clients um, 
where it's actually a natural shift of us actually needing to close our relationship. So yeah. even if we started off and we've progressed and we've done like such great work and it was such a good fit, if I start to feel resistance or um, that there's some kind of decline in terms of like the progression, I also am like, ooh, here's an indicator for me too to check in with my client to say, do we need to realign? Are you getting what you need from this right now? Um, do we need to set some new goals? Mm. Do we actually need to shift our work and have you move into a relationship with somebody else? Because mm -hmm. again, if I'm still coming from the standpoint of, are they getting what they need out of this relationship? It's not about me and what I'm getting from it. It's, it's saying, okay, what's, what's next in the evolution for this client? Mm -hmm. Sometimes that means that we need to end our relationship. Yeah. Um, sometimes that means that we actually just need to fully shift the way that we're working together and mix it up yeah. so that it becomes alive again. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. You mentioned um, intuition earlier and intuition has been something that's that in my mind has been evolving a little bit mm -hmm. um, because there's so many people out there that you, I mean, intuition, we hear that word a lot, right? People throw that around. I'm just going to go with my gut and you know, yeah. it's my, you know, it doesn't it feels feel so right. Weird. Yeah. And people are making big decisions, big decisions sometimes solely on intuition. And I like what you said about intuition, like do your research and go with your intuition. Yeah. And this is a big thing for me. I, I wasn't using, um, I don't think I, I was hearing or using the word intuition um, the same as I am now, you know, even a year ago, because I thought that intuition was just like, okay, what, what do I, what do I, what am I sensing right now? You know, mm -hmm. and I, and I have a pretty good intuition, but I, but I strongly now very much feel that people need to research things and then use your intuition. Yeah. There needs to be some data and then, and then, you know, okay, now what's your gut telling you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And for me, intuition is more about the check-in with self. Um, yes, it is like, what information have I gathered? And then how do I feel about it? Right? So it's like the trusting of I'm having a response to this and it means something. Yes. But just the automatic response to something without information, without data, without gathering, and not just one piece of data in my mind, it's multiple pieces of data. Yeah. Um, then you can make an informed decision, but you do really, I think it is this learning how to trust self. Yes. But I know people that trust self a little too much with no data. <laughs> right. You know, the whole, uh, and, and so I come from, you know, a healthcare background and, and I, and I recognize the, the uh, limits of Western medicine for sure. Mm -hmm. um, however, you know, my, my latest job in healthcare was around vaccinations. And so there was a whole like vaccinate people are all on board now, of course, because mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a, there's an upswing in uh, preventable diseases. However, um, prior to that, you know, we were dealing with quite a strong anti-vaccination movement and um, you know, and I, and I would, I would come across a lot of people who would say, you know what, I, I just, you know, intuitively, I've decided not to vaccinate my children because there's, there's <laughs> toxins in the vaccine and I don't mm -hmm. want to, and, and it's not, you know, and, and, and it would almost get into conspiracy theories around, you know, big pharma and what, and the government and they're, and they're, they're trying to control us. And I'm like, Oh my God, please do some research. Like I'm okay with you not vaccinating, but please make it an informed choice. Right. Right. You know, absolutely. So, you know, yeah. I'll tie this back to, to coaching for a minute in terms of, you know, it's, it's fun working with clients that, that, that start out that way, or they're, they're one-sided, right? It's all data, no self-informed decisions, yes. or it's all self-informed, no data. Yeah. And so my job as a coach is not to say, well, you're missing something here. It's more to ask the questions to help them see that there's more places they need to look so that they are fully informed yeah. from self, from external at the same time. So, yeah. um, you know, even questions like, um, what are you not seeing here? Yeah. <laughs> what, um, when you look back on this decision, what will you wish that you knew? 
So if you make this decision from this place of purely self and you look back on it five years from now, what do you wish that you knew? So things like that. So it's all I'm doing is saying is helping to broaden perspective and help them see that there's actually some other places to look here without telling them you're missing something. Yeah. That's such a coach approach, right? That's right, such that's a coach, coach approach. Absolutely. Uh, whereas I would say, I think you're missing something here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's appropriate in yeah. certain situations where yeah. it is, you know, you work in cases that are more traumatic. You need to be more directive because it comes down to people's safety. Right. Um, so you yeah, have yeah. more of that in your practice and absolutely being more directive is necessary. In those yeah. Yeah, it is. And that's, and it is what I do. I mean, people don't call me be, because I'm a coach. People call me because I've been through what they're going through and yeah. they want to know, what do I know? Mm -hmm. They're looking for expertise in an area. And so, yeah, that's what I deliver, but that's hilarious. Yeah. I would be just like, <laughs> yeah, you're missing something. And so I'm, I started to giggle as soon as you said, okay, I'm going to take this back to coaching because mm -hmm. you are so good at that. And this is what I've noticed when we co-facilitate, like we facilitate and I'm like, Wee! over here and you are very like, okay, let's bring this back now mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, the curriculum and what we want the uh, class to know. Um, and it's such, it's such a, it's such a gift. I think uh, you're very, very good at that, you know, pulling it all together, bringing it back, um, reminding us what we're here to learn, back to the objectives, tying it together. Um, you are a master uh, facilitator, and uh, I love the way you do that, especially when we're working Thank together, you. because I can, I can get all star in the sky and let's go down a rabbit hole and play, and, <laughs> and you're like, um, let's come back, let's come back now. I think we're a... a a beautiful match together in the in the classroom because we, we're bringing different styles and we respect each other's styles so much and I love seeing how um, like the playfulness that you bring out in everybody and because you're so playful and you're yeah you're like let's go over here and I'm like yeah let's do it and then let's make sure we come back to why we're here in the first place um, I think yeah. it's a really fun fun play we have between the two of us. It is. And I'm, and I am really excited about this curriculum that we're pulling together for the end of April. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit on this yeah. podcast? Okay. What do yeah, you, what absolutely. do you want the world to know about this? Um, well, that's a, that's a big question right now it is. It because, is. um, what I want people to know is that, um, this course that we we're going to be offering is primarily around communication and, and it's done in a way that I think is very relevant to the times that we are going through right now. Um, but it's also applicable to any other time in life because we all experience um, a disconnect in terms of our relationships, um, whether that is at work or at home, when there's a lack of communication. And it's not to say that we're not communicating with people. It's like, are we communicating well with people? You add stress, you add change, you add conflict, you add uncertainty into the mix, and it becomes that much harder. Yeah. But what we need right now is to be able to communicate with people effectively. And I, you know, we teach, you know, these skills together at SATE. We both teach these with our clients, right? In sometimes in a subtle kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, and and the feedback I always get is people are saying, I want more of that. I need more of that. I wish I had these skills sooner. Um, we've never had anyone, and in the history of time, I've never heard anyone say, I don't really need communication skills in my no. life. <laughs> so that really wasn't applicable helpful. to me. That's I not helpful. I knew all that. Nobody yeah. ever says no, never. that. That's true. Yeah. yeah. You're right. And people will come into, you know, my my uh, work and your work too and and our work together and doesn't matter what the the title of what we're doing is when we start to go through okay why did you sign up for this what do you need you know what are, would well, how are you hoping to be changed by this time together etc there's always you know i need to know how to handle conflict you know yeah. i need to know I, I need to know how to say no. Mm -hmm. I need to learn how to, you know, get my point across. 
I need to learn how to understand, you know, why do people behave this way? Why are people so resistant, you know? And then it's all, it's, it's always coming up, right? Always. It doesn't, they don't always say it like that, but underneath what they're saying behind Mm -hmm. what they're saying, there is the common threads of people, especially Canadian culture. We don't know how to, to be honest and ask for what we need. Yeah. Um, we struggle to be aware of, of, you know, when we're, when we're bothered by someone who's being resistant or, or not hearing us, or, you know, we have to say things 10 times. Why I already said that. Why don't you get it? You know, people aren't very good at understanding, you know, their role in that. Right. Yeah. Respecting Um, what's happening on the other side for people. Yeah. All they see is the behavior and they go, well, it's wrong because it's yeah. not what I want from them. So then there's this, there's this fight against that behavior. And so, yeah, it creates so many problems for people. Um, and tension. so I love tension and people don't like tension and people don't like discomfort. And they, so they just stop communicating or connecting with these people. And that's really difficult if you, A, live in the same house. <laughs> or B, work in the same office, um, you know, live in the same community. And so I see so many people that are just avoiding, you know, the discomfort. And I think what we teach in these courses is giving people the confidence and the tools to be able to navigate that and be okay with the discomfort because what they end up seeing on the other side of that is something really powerful, something really freeing for them. Again, whether that's at home or at work. Yeah. So I love the work. I think it is important for every single person. Yeah. Um, and I think we've got something to offer people that's needed right now. Yeah. And I mean, things are, things are changing so fast. People are mm-hmm. remote. People are trying. People are, people like you say, they're stressed, mm-hmm. which affects how you communicate mm-hmm. or don't communicate. Um, people aren't face to face. So they're, they're being challenged to communicate in new ways using different channels. Um, I mean, we've experienced it a little bit, you know, suddenly there's no communication from a group or an organization and you're like, yes, (laughs) what's happening? Is anybody going to tell me? Right. So then our tendency and, you know, with as much training as we have, um, all the tools that we have in our toolbox, you know, I still notice myself building stories about it. Of course. I'm like, well, there hasn't been this communication and I know that this other thing is going on. So the logical story for me to build is this, yes. which is totally untrue. It's actually not based on anything. No, um, no. But the mind so, doesn't like ambiguity, like you say, right? So right. we make, so if we don't have information, we'll make some up. Yeah. We'll just fill in the blanks with whatever we can grab. And it doesn't matter if it's true or not. We just no. try to complete the story. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, so I'm seeing all kinds of things. I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing some wonderful um, communication and I'm seeing some abysmal uh, communication mm. and I'm seeing um, people who really struggle to figure out what they need and then to figure out how to ask for it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting, like you say, even with all the tools in our own toolbox, I mean, we know this stuff, right? We teach it, we talk about it, we live it. Um, And yet I'm noticing my own responses to things too, like Mm -hmm. an idiot or Mm -hmm. that's dumb or, you know, yeah, it's so interesting to notice in myself and giving up on people too. I just give up. I give up like, well, you know what? That's not, well, clearly, you know, I've tried a couple times and that doesn't work. So <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll be done for a while, you right. know, and I'm like, that's not good either. So really, really spending some time reflecting on, okay, so what, what is my response? Like we talked about this the other day. I get really flippant. Um, I notice myself getting really flippant when people are, I think, unduly worried you know, people are like, oh, what's going to happen? Like they're living in fear of an unknown future and they're just, you know, talking catastrophe after catastrophe and it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. And I'm like, oh. and I get flippant and, and that's my own fear. That's my own fear. Right. You just can't even go like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want this to infiltrate my world right now. No, 
no, so I get dismissive and flippant, yeah. which is not a great way to connect with people, um, leaves other people feeling unheard. It, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. not really representative of what I'm about, you know, um, and yet I do notice myself doing it. And so, yeah, just noticing those kind of things. And then that's kind of part of what we're going to talk about in this yeah. course, too. We're going to talk about how to tap into your own responses and why yeah. that's happening. What is that, you know? that's good information for you mm -hmm. and what are you going to do with it and how do you how do you keep connecting and communicating effectively when right. that's going on so right absolutely yeah. yeah there is this like um you know what's showing up for me as you're as you're talking about this is like teaching people how to and this again this is applicable for every stage of life no matter what is happening in the world is how do you have grace for yourself in the moment when it is hard, it is so hard and you're messing up and you're, you know, breaking things. And how do you have grace for yourself in that moment? And also say, is this how I want to stay? Yeah, exactly. What do I, is this what what I'm do about? I need, need yeah. to do in order for this to be different or for me to be better, for me to show up in a different way? So it's like this, you know, and this is, this is coaching. This is development is like this paradox between you're enough right now and there's more for you like you're doing your best right now and you can be better mm -hmm. so it it is this constant sort of like back and forth between the two and i feel like that's so necessary in our world right now i know i have to keep checking in with myself too but by you know thinking i'm like oh, i'm failing at this or i'm I'm, I didn't show up in the way that I wanted to for somebody today because I was like, I can't even, I can't hear another conversation about this and they're struggling <laughs> and I want to show up for them. And I'm like, yeah. can we just move on to action now? And I just want to <laughs> yes. move through it. Um, so it is like having grace for 